Church, good to see you. I uh, hope you're already in John chapter 12 as I see that video. A uh, couple things. One, very grateful for the last couple weeks with uh, Tebow and then uh, Dan Leanne. Uh, and then secondly, my thought was, bro, I got to hit the gym or something because both those guys are ripped. I'm like, I got to go carnivore. I got to do something. But great job. I know you guys were uh, blessed uh, by them. And I want to say hello to the other campuses as well. I mean, guys doing a great work around uh, the great, beautiful uh, 828. Seeing a lot of those Florida license plates. So if you're here with us from uh, Florida, we're super glad that you have uh, joined us at one of our locations as well. Uh, a couple shout outs to folks online. We got folks from our neighboring state of Tennessee. We got some folks from Montana. Uh, uh, they said they're at the Yellowstone, but uh, Massachusetts, California, and we've got some folks from Flower Mound, Texas as well. So thank you guys very much for uh, joining us. Two quick things. Uh, I know it's the middle of the summer, but uh, August is right around the corner, and throughout the month of August at every location, there'll be a starting point meal, which if you've been uh, a guest here, or just kind of uh, first timers here this summer, that is a place where you can figure out, hey, is this the place for me? This is what we're about. Get a great meal. Uh, how do I get involved with community? All that kind of stuff. And you can just go again to the church website, builtmorechurch.com slash starting point. It's on the homepage as well. And middle schoolers and high schoolers and church, we are about eight days away from student camp. And if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, please hear me, mom and dad. Make sure they're signed up. You can get them signed up in the lobby. You can text CAMP to 28282. You can put a hieroglyphic in the sky. Whatever you want to do, we will get them signed up. But by all means, do not miss this, man. We're all for cheerleading camps. And we're all for all those other camps. But this is the time where God moves every single year at our camp. And bottom line is, your student ain't going to be a professional baseball player. He's just not. He's just not. You're like, yeah, he is. He's not. He's just not going. He's not that good. He's just not going to be that guy. But guess what? God wants to get a hold of his life at student camp, so make sure he is signed up for that. All right, fun emails coming already. So here's where we are. Uh, John chapter 12. John chapter 12 is where we're going to be. And a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, it's COVID time, so I can't remember how many years ago it was. But I told you a story, or I mentioned a man uh, who was a theologian in like the 30s and the 40s and a preacher, and his name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer wrote a book. If you've ever heard of the name, you might have heard it because he wrote a great book called uh, The Cost of Discipleship, The Cost of Discipleship. But basically, he was one of those pastors that actually stood up to Hitler and the Gestapo and Nazi uh, government in Germany as they began to take over everything. And um, one of the things he did is he saw the church in Germany capitulating to Hitler, compromising their values, compromising their beliefs so much so that the church in Germany started to become almost like a second arm of Hitler. And Bonhoeffer's like, this cannot be, this cannot be. And so one of the things Bonhoeffer did is Bonhoeffer started a seminary out in some small rural town and he set the bar super high. I mean, he set it high, he said, this is a place that's gonna be about orthodoxy, it's gonna be about prayer, it's gonna be about the Bible, about the Bible. it's gonna be about biblical fidelity, it's gonna be about repentance, that's what we're gonna be about. It's no games, no playing around, we mean business here. And so he opened it up to people that wanted to come and study and be real and be serious about the gospel. And people got a little worried about how serious he was and the expectations that he put on the people that came to his seminary. They got so worried, some of the people in Germany, and even as far as over here in the States, they're like, man, are you kind of taking this a little bit too far? Are you asking a little bit too much of these people? And one of his friends actually came over there to check on him to see if he'd taken it too far, asking too much, pushing too much on these people that have come to this little seminary. And as the guy came over, one of his friends came over, they began to discuss about what the seminary was doing and the people it was training up and the pastors that it was going to be sending out. And he began to show concern to Bonhoeffer, hey, you're a little too serious about this. And so Bonhoeffer said, hey, get in this boat. And they got in a little boat and they went across this little channel. And then they climbed up on this hill. And on this hill, they could look over the channel. And across the water, they could see Hitler's army machine. They could see planes practicing, taking off and landing, taking off and landing. Thousands just practice, 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 practice. They could see all the soldiers march, marching in lockstep in uniformity, training, making sure that they were the soldiers that Hitler was wanting. And so what Bonhoeffer did is Bonhoeffer made sure his friends saw that sight 
And he said, this, meaning his seminary, this seminary must be greater than that. What we're doing here at this seminary has got to be greater than what Hitler is doing. Discipleship, he was saying, discipleship has got to be greater than the church capitulating to culture. And we're going to see his story. And by the way, even though the Gestapo came in and they closed down that seminary in 1937, even though Hitler took Bonhoeffer and hung him and some other pastors by the neck until they were dead in 1945, that little seminary, that little seed that was planted germinated and all of it just spread like wildfire and affected millions and millions and millions of people and even brought the church in Germany back and they repented and came back to the Bible. All of that to say, you're going to see a story today in John chapter 12 that has a similar tone. The tone is one that the example is so great that it says, listen, our passion has got to be greater than any apathy. Our celebration about what Jesus has done has got to be greater and stronger than what the culture wants to suck you into. Our gratitude for the gospel has got to be greater than our entitlement. And so we're going to walk through this passage, and one of the amazing things that you'll see is if we will act, there's, there's built-in blessings on this deal. If you and I grasp this, not only does the overflow get to bless us, but when we get blessed, guess what? It shows us how we can bless other people. And as we bless other people in our communities, believe it or not, it actually shows us that in doing so, God himself is also blessed. So John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Here's kind of the context just real quick. This is the turning point of the gospel of John. For 11 chapters, the gospel of John is covered about three, almost three and a half years. So chapters 1 to 11, it's been all about three and a half years of public ministry. Miracles, sermons, all of that stuff. But, the la- but from chapter 12 all the way to chapter 20 covers one week. He goes from public ministry to private mentoring, and then finally, the passion of the Christ on the cross. That's what this next eight or nine chapters is all about. And when you look at it, uh, in a week from where we're at now, Jesus will be dead. Last week, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead Some of the people believed. Some of the people like, if you can raise somebody from the dead, I'm on team Jesus. That's the way some of y'all came on team Jesus as well. You saw your coworker, life changed. You're like, man, I gotta figure something out. If you got that, I gotta figure that out. Some of you had a teammate. Jesus changed their life and that's, that's what God used to draw you to himself. That's what he used for me. I had three brothers. I saw them come from death to life, totally changed people and that was the what God used to draw me. But not everybody who saw Lazarus come up out of the tomb believed. Some of them went entitled on Jesus. At the end of chapter 11, they're like, hey, here's what he's doing and he wasn't doing it correctly and they're like, hey, you need to do something. And so from here on out, what you see is the religious leaders are plotting to kill Jesus. You see them trying to figure out where's he going to be, when's the crowd going to be gone, so we can come in there and nab him and then kill him. And by the way, that also tells you why they come and pay Judas off, and Judas kind of comes and kisses him all that whole betrayal. It's because they needed an inside guy. They needed somebody who would come and identify him when the crowds weren't around or tell them where he was. And you'll see that play out here in a couple of chapters. But verse 1 of chapter 12 Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. Bethany is like a suburb of Jerusalem where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Okay, just real quick, if you're new to Bible study, uh, uh, probably uh, one of the main points you need to understand is when it says the Passover, this is the third time John has used Passover as far as like a, a calendar marking. Passover, again, was a celebration that they had, but that looked back thousands of years to when God set his people free from Pharaoh, from Egypt. And if you're new to Bible study again, he did it through 10 plagues, and he gets an amazing story, but the 10th plague was what was called the plague of the firstborn. And he says, listen, if you will go out and you will kill a lamb and put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of your house, then the wrath of God, the justice of God will pass over you. That's where we get our word Passover from. He will pass over your house and you will be spared and you will show mercy. 
And so for thousands of years in the Old Testament, you see that scarlet thread throughout the Bible, starting in really in Genesis 3, but then in Exodus, all those lambs, all those bulls, all that sacrificial stuff that sometimes people are like, what does that even mean? It's all talking about what Jesus is going to fulfill. And so at the start of this gospel, John the Baptist steps out and he says, listen, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not a Lamb of God who covers your sin, because in the Old Testament, it was like taking a shower. You'd sacrifice it, but you have to do it again the next year. So you take a shower, you're smelly again. The next day, you've got to take another shower. But now it's like the Lamb of God who takes away, not just covers, he takes away the sin of the world. And so this, the population of Jerusalem would swell. All these people from all over, they would come into Jerusalem to do their sacrifice, to sacrifice these animals like they'd done for many, 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 many years. And so verse 2 says this, so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus, the guy that just got raised from the dead, they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at table. All right, there's a dinner party going on. And John doesn't tell us who it is, but Matthew and Mark have the same scene. And Matthew and Mark tell us who is giving the dinner party, and it's a guy named Simon the leper. Now, Simon the leper, now, we don't have a lot of story about that, but one of the things we can kind of read into, Simon the leper, you couldn't have a dinner party if you were a leper. You couldn't. I mean, you couldn't even, you couldn't go to temple. You couldn't have a dinner party. You couldn't even be, you couldn't even be around people. So apparently, Simon the leper was like Simon the former leper, all right? By the way, that's a great one. There's a lot of times we, ask, we, we label people about who they used to be, and it's like, well, that's John the divorcee, or, or that, that, that Susie the lady who got an abortion, or that's whoever, and what we understand is the gospel doesn't label us about what we used to be, but he labels about what Jesus has done. And so Simon, Simon is no longer just Simon the leper. Simon's like the, Simon's the former leper. You could call him Simon the healed, all right? Simon the clean. And so Simon has had this amazing thing happen to him, and he's like, man, I want to show some gratitude to Jesus. He has changed my life. He has changed me physically. I'm clean. He's changed me spiritually. I can go to be with God's people and sing God's praises and listen to God's word. I can do that. My family's been blessed by Jesus. I can now be around them. I don't have to stay out on the outskirts of town. So he's having, he's having a gratitude party is what he's having. He's having a gratitude party. And when Simon thinks about who should I invite to my party, he's like, man, you know what? Lazarus. Lazarus has got some stuff that he should be thankful for as well. He's got some stuff he ought to be grateful for because you know what? It wasn't but a few days ago when he was dead and look what Jesus did for him. And let me invite Mary and Martha too because Mary and Martha, guess what? That was their family that got affected. Their family got blessed. So they're having a gratitude party. They're super, super thankful. Now here, I say all that to say this, church. I mean, this is so healthy for us. Every time we gather to worship, every time we sing these songs, every time we gather together, it is to be a gratitude party. That's what this is. Whether you're at Hendersonville, Brevard, East Asheville, West Asheville, Espanol, Franklin, Arden, Buncombe County Correctional Center, whatever location you're at, it is Simon the Leper's house. That's what it is. We're just a bunch of people. We're a bunch of people who were blind and now Jesus lets us see. All right? We were unclean and now Jesus has made us clean. We were lame and then Jesus came in and changed us. And not just you sometimes, sometimes it's your family. So two years ago, some of your marriages were in the toilet. They were. You were heading off to the JP or you were heading off to the courthouse to figure out how do you end this thing. And then God did a miracle. And what you and I do, we come here together and we're like, I'm grateful. I'm going to have a gratitude party. And it's good for us to be grateful. It's healthy for us to be grateful. Psalm 9 says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. And what I was reminded of is one of my buddies said this, we all live on the continuum between entitlement and gratitude. We all are living on that continuum between entitlements. Like, man, I deserve this stuff. And I this stuff just ought to come to me because I, I deserve this. And then gratitude is like, man, look what God has done. And so a lot of times I've just told you, it's like you ought to keep a gratitude list on your phone. I mean, have, a, have the same number of things as the number of years you are. So some of you, if you're 30 years old, one of the healthiest things you can do 
is just to have 30 things on your phone. When you start feeling whiny and you start feeling entitled and you start feeling like, I deserve better, I mean, just whip out that list and go, you know what? Here's the way God's blessed me. And you, know, and you can start off with the big, massive stuff. Man, I'm grateful for what Jesus has done. I'm grateful for the Spirit of God that teaches me the Word of God. I'm grateful for my connect group that I get to go and do life with. But you can go to normal stuff. You can go to other stuff. But I'm grateful that I drive a Ford, not a Chevy. Or I'm grateful, for, I'm, grateful that, I'm grateful that I have an awesome wife. Or I'm grateful that my kids are healthy. I'm grateful that I got a house and a roof over my head. And just list 30 of them. And so when you look at this, they're having a gratitude party. And they show it a bunch of different ways. Look at verse 2. All of these are helpful, by the way. And all of these are appropriate about the way they show gratitude. Martha's serving. What do I need to do? What, do I, what can I do? What can I do to serve? This is actually the missing link in some Christians' joy. And I'll, we'll get to that in a different week. I was talking... Tebow pointed out something. He didn't point it out in a sermon. He pointed it out in a discussion. He, called, he said something I had never heard before, but then I looked it up, and it's called the helper's high. The helper's high is basically the chemical part of you that reacts in your brain when you help somebody. When you help somebody, and it could be anything. It could be helping a senior adult with the groceries. It could be serving in preschool. It could be out in the parking lot. All right? it, could be any, it, could be giving, it could be sponsoring a compassion child. It could be anything at all. But what happens is when you and I do something with no expectation of return, you and I just do something to help somebody, this stuff, these chemicals kick in, this serotonin and dopamine and all this kind of stuff, it kicks in as you help somebody. And that's why people are like, man, that person is so happy serving somebody else. And that's why people who never serve are some of the most miserable, unhappy, even believers. It's called the helpers. It's called the helpers high. Jesus said it's more, it's what Jesus meant when he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And some people see that and they're like, man, it's amazing. It's amazing. Science has proved Jesus is right. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesus is always right. Science just caught up to what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. And he's saying, you know what? You serve somebody else, it comes back to you. And that's what Martha's doing. I got some Martha in me. I'd rather do, uh, doing stuff is pretty easy. Second thing you have in here is Lazarus. And it says, Lazarus was reclining with him at table. And the way they would do it back then is you didn't have, forget the Leonardo da Vinci pictures of the Last Supper, all right? Just forget all that stuff. And this isn't the Last Supper yet, but this, he's reclining at table. They didn't sit down in high throne back chairs, okay? They didn't. They would lay down typically on an elbow, put their feet out because the feet were nasty and they didn't, you didn't want you to put your feet in somebody's, you know, barbecue. You didn't want that. So you put your feet back and you, you talked. And I love this. It just says he was reclining at the table. So what's he doing? But he's just having time with Jesus. He's just talking with him, listening to him. And that's a great way to show you, to say thanks as well. You know, one thing COVID taught us, one thing COVID taught us was spending time with Jesus is not a matter of busyness. It's just a matter of priority. It is. It's just, you know, it's, I don't have time to have a quiet time. I don't, no, no, no. no. You, have 20, you have the same amount of hours I do. The guy next to you has got the same amount of hours you do. It's just, do I want to do that? He's just abiding. He's just sitting there. And that's one of the things we talk about all the time. I mean, get a cup of coffee, get a Bible, talk to Jesus, let Jesus talk to you. It's a great way to show thanks. It's like, I don't want to spend any time with you. Not exactly gracious. But here's verse 3. This is kind of the focus. Mary, third, this is the third response. One of them is serving. One of them is spending time with the Lord. But verse 3, Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard. It's like somewhere, you know, I don't know exactly where that would have come from, like Pakistan area maybe. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Let me kind of explain what's going on here. If you're not new, if you've been in church a long time, you and I can just like fly right on by this. This is like an amazing, I've been listening to uh it's C.C. Winan song. It's like from 20 years ago, Alabaster Box, like all weekend. And it's like, oh, in heaven, I get to sing like that. That's what I get to sing. It's just amazing. Some of y'all need to put it and listen to it this afternoon. But here's, here's the idea. Is this, this was like a family treasure. In a few verses, it's going to say, that thing could have been sold for 300 denarii. Denarii is like one day's work. So it's basically a year's work. I don't know what the average income and 
Western North Carolina is, let's just say it's 35,000 bucks, 40,000 bucks, all right? That's kind of, this was like the savings. They would save up. I mean, how long, if you're making 40 grand, how long is that gonna take you to save, actually save 40 grand? That's what she's doing. She's taking that thing that is so precious. And by the way, she is breaking so many cultural norms in this scene. I mean, three of them right off the bat, just the cultural norms that she is breaking. Number one, you don't touch another person's feet unless you were like the lowest of the low. It was degrading to touch somebody else's feet. And she's like not just touching the feet, washing the feet. She's like drying it with her hair. Secondly, you didn't touch another man that wasn't your husband in public. Thirdly, a lady in that culture, it was shameful to take your hair down. She's like, I'm taking this thing down and I'm wiping his feet. And you know what? Some commentators say that this would have represented her dowry. That thing that would go along with her when some guy would come and say, you know what? I want to marry you. And the dowry was what they would give to the guy. And she's like, forget all of that. I am putting it all on Jesus. This is, a, this is awkward. It's extraordinary. It is emotional. It is, it is spontaneous, it is all of that stuff. And yet the Bible says the house was filled with the fragrance, it changed the whole, it just changed the whole thing. So here's some questions. When you look at Mary and the way that she responded to the presence of Jesus, is that how you sing? Is that how you worship? You go back 15 minutes, 15 minutes, when you're singing, oh, praise the name, or banner or great things God has done. Is that, the, is that the way? Do you sing like a saved person? Do you sing like somebody who Jesus has come in and healed their family? Yeah, I, I know, uh, and I know, because I've told you before, I'm, I struggle with emotions. I'm working on it, okay? Been working on it for 35, 40 years, or really 30 years since we got, got, got married. I didn't work on it much before that, but I work on it now. And emotions, some of you guys, some of you, maybe ladies too, you're like, man, that's just so emotional and I don't really like that kind of thing. It's just, when you really love somebody, it is going to at times come out emotionally. It, it just is. Not every time, not all the time, but oftentimes. Here's an example. Husbands, if you are married how did you or why did you propose to your wife? Did you do so simply based on genetics? Like, yeah, you know what? That, uh, we make pretty babies. That's why, that's, that's why I'm going to ask her to marry me. It was like, man, good DNA right there. Good DNA. All right. No, it wasn't matter of fact robotic. It was like, man, when I get in the room with her, something happens, man. I got the butterflies and sweats and I'm just, I love her. There's some emotion there. And the question is, is that the way you worship? Because the contrast is not where we want to be. Because the contrast is in verse 4, and it says, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him. Remember, John wrote this book about 60 years after the happenings of this. So he's looking back and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit giving us an insight that they didn't know at the time that Judas was actually a thief. And said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Before we get too harsh on Judas, which it's fine, Judas was not the sinister guy in the corner that everybody thought was the villain. He was the treasure. Who do you make the treasure? Somebody that generally is respected and trusted. The other accounts actually say the other disciples, they were also kind of making fun of Mary for a different reason. Theirs was more pragmatism, like really, how do we help the poor? Is where Judas was like, how do I help myself? But either way, they were both saying, this is just useless. This is wasteful. Why are we doing this? You know, in some ways, uh, they were correct. Listen to me carefully. I think it's Jonathan Edwards, a Puritan theologian. He said, the thing about what Judas and the disciples said about being wasteful 
or at least about being useless, is in, in, in fact, being useless was 100% correct. It was useless to Jesus. He didn't need that expensive anointing. It smelled good, but it would be gone for a couple, in a couple hours. It was in some ways useless to Mary because you know what? Mary was already a follower of Jesus. If you look back one chapter, Jesus said, listen, you're going to be with me in heaven anyway. So she didn't have to perform or something to get Jesus to love her. So it was useless to Mary. It was useless to Jesus in some ways. The act served one purpose only, built more church. It served one purpose. It was simply to say, Jesus, you are worthy, and you are so much more worthy than any treasure that I have been pouring my life into. You are, so, you are worth a thousand alabaster boxes. And I want to put that on display. One of the other gospel accounts says this will be talked about forever and ever. And here we are 2,000 years later talking about something that happened in a little house on the other side of the world. And what uh, struck me pretty strongly here is Judas is a consumer and Mary is a worshiper. Judas is a picture of a consumer. Consumer, a consumer Christian, says he was a disciple, but he was a consumer, a customer. Mary was a worshiper. And don't, don't, I'm gonna give you four pictures of a distinction between a consumer and a worshiper. You can write them down if you want to. I'm gonna put them out. I forgot to get them to the, all the tech guys to be able to kind of put up on the screen. I know how some of you guys love to jot notes down and we'll put them out later. I'm gonna give you four. And don't use it to look necessarily back at Judas. Look at yourself because we've all got some Judas in us. As a matter of fact, sometimes you can actually go back toward consumerism when you once were a worshiper. So number one, a consumer says Jesus is useful a worshiper says Jesus is beautiful. A consumer, Jesus is a means to an end. Jesus does something for me. He kind of, you know, he makes, makes my wife happy that we go to church. He makes my kids happy because they like the student ministry. Yeah, I'm, uh, that's fine. But what Mary is, is Mary's like, you know what? I love Jesus, period. If he never does one more thing for me, he is the treasure. He is the reward. He is the blessing. Not all the stuff, not all the gifts, but just him. A consumer will sell out when it gets difficult. A consumer will sell out when it gets difficult. A worship will not sell out, but they are sold out to Jesus. Not perfect, but surrendered. So for example, it's the most famous betrayal. Judas had a price. In this case, it was 30 pieces of silver. The text says, Judas will betray him. Judas had a price. They said, will you betray him for 30 pieces of silver? And he says, bingo, yes, I will. And while we scoff at him, most of us can look back over the last year and say, you know what, we have a price as well. And sometimes it's stuff that we are not willing to give up even now. And we won't surrender now. Sometimes you're at the, country club or you're at the airport or you're at the practice or you're at whatever and somebody kind of starts to intimate a little bit about, hey, I saw you go to that church or hey, I saw you have, saw your Bible in your backpack or whatever that is and you and I just kind of shrink back. I've told you before to my shame, I'm getting better at it, but there probably, there have been a handful of times when I've gotten on an airplane and I've actually whispered a prayer, it's like, God, please help nobody sit next to me. Or even worse, please help this guy to keep his mouth closed because I got a sermon to get ready. I got to get a sermon ready to feed God's people and this guy is going to bug me. Okay, you all laugh. You had not done the same thing? How about uh, sexual ethics? You know what? Everything but that. I don't want to move out from my boyfriend. I don't want to move out from him because you know what? He might be the one, which by the way, young lady, statistically, just, just pure statistics, the chances of you actually marrying him decrease by living with him, just so you know. 
And the chances of you staying married to him, if you ever do marry him, if you live with him beforehand, those go down as well. So don't believe the lie. Some of you, it's super simple. You're in here, you raised your hand when Clayton or somebody preached, and you're like, I'm a Christ follower. And you know, it's like five times God has said, get your fanny in the baptistry. Don't be ashamed of me. And you're like, well, next week, next month, wait till I get my hair cut, wait till my family comes in town. And all of a sudden, a week's turned into a month, turned into a year. You know, you're a consumer instead of a worshiper is when you're critical of other people and their worship. As opposed to a worshiper is a contributor to the worship. See what Judas does? Really all the disciples do it. It's like she's doing it wrong. She's too far out there. And by the way, religious people really get uneasy when gospel-centered worship happens and people actually have some emotion getting into it. You notice that? It's like, hey, she's doing it wrong. She's not doing it right. She should have done this. She should have done that. I don't like this song. I don't like that singer. The way she moves when she's up there, that's not helpful. What's a contributor do? A contributor looks at the song and says, you know what? There is nothing God can't do. Nothing God can't do. He sings a song like Banner, Christ forever and no other. Jesus, your name be the banner over me. You're really focused on not just spirit, but truth as well. You know what You know what a worshiper looks like in a church service? You got your Bible out or your phone. Again, sometimes people are like, the phone doesn't count. Phone does count, okay? If the phone, as long as you're not like checking the British Open or whatever, the phone can count, all right? It's awesome Bible apps. You can, all that kind of, all, that's awesome. But you have it out. You're leaning in. You're asking the questions like, hey, I got to write this down. Or how does this go over to this passage? But somebody who is uh, just a consumer is like, man, man, this place is too big, too loud. These people are too hypocritical. Here's the last one is uh, you see it in Judas. Judas is all about him. Judas is all about self. It's all about self. I got to figure out how to get that 300 denarii, how to get that in the bucket so I can go back and steal it later. It's all about self. It's all about greed. It's when you get super nervous when the offering is passed, you get super nervous when I talk about money. We're not talking about money, so relax, all right? I'm just saying you get super uptight when that happens. But on the other hand, a worshiper is like, how do I serve? You know, a Christian actually technically means a little Christ. And our Christ said what? I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So as a Christ follower, you come to church and you're like, how do I serve? How do I serve? Sometimes it might be something formal, parking lot, preschool, students, whatever. And sometimes it's just an attitude that you walk into a place like this and you're actually looking and you see somebody in the the lobby and they're walking around like, well, I don't know where the restroom is. And you just, not in a weird way, not in an awkward way, not in a get in their space way. It's like, hey, can I help you? Any way I can help you? Why? Because you're just just serving. So here's the way it ends. Verse 7 says, Jesus said, leave her alone. That's a rebuke. Just stop criticizing her. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. She's already looking at, I don't know how much Mary knew what was going on. Jesus is going to be in the tomb in a week. Jesus knows. I don't know if Mary does. Something was happening with her to say, I'm going to do this. And here's a, a, a verse that throws people. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Okay, let's take verse 7 then verse 8. Verse 7, when he says, you know what, stop criticizing her, stop criticizing her, she is doing this for my burial. And what he's foreshadowing, again, is the fact that on the cross, he is going to die for her in a week. Loved ones, here's what you've got to understand about worship. Worship is about two things, who God is and what God has done. It's the character and nature of who Jesus is and the act that Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Every song, every sermon in some way will center around those two things, and they dovetail. And the reason you and I can have this gratitude party, even if your week stunk, 
I'm talking about if, you're, if you had the worst week. When you and I come in here, what it's a reminder of is someone is on the throne and it's not you. Somebody's on the throne and it's not you. And that's awesome news. And the reason you worship if you're a Christ follower is not because you won the lottery, not because your kids got straight A's. Those are great things to be grateful for. But the reason you worship and have a gratitude party is because of what Jesus did on the cross. He took your sin. He absorbed the justice of God that you deserved. He adopted you as a son or a daughter. He gave you a new heart. He gave you a new name. He gave you a new family. He took away your condemnation. He lifted your head. He removed your shame. The Bible says he will never leave you or forsake you. So the reason you and I sing, the reason you and I sing, and we don't sing a bunch of songs about our good intentions. If you just want to know our philosophy, the songs we sing are about God. That's the songs we sing. Because one encounter with a holy God will change you like in an instant versus five little helpful things and my intentions and New Year's resolutions. No, it's like centered back to what has God done? And then everything flows from that. The activity does flow from that. Remember, we talked about we serve the community. Why? Because Jesus served us in the gospel. We humble ourselves. Why? Because Jesus humbled himself. We are generous. Why? Because Jesus was generous with us. And that's what he's talking about in verse 8. So verse 8, people are like, well, did Jesus not care for the poor? Of course Jesus cared for the poor. His whole ministry was about, he was ministering to poor people. Look at the Old Testament. So much stuff about how God's people are supposed to help the poor and be generous to the poor. If you read the minor prophets, the minor prophets basically say, listen, hey, church, if you don't help the poor, your religion is worthless. And then the half-brother of Jesus comes along in the book of James and says that exact thing over again as well. So what's he saying? I mean, Jesus is pro-helping the poor. I mean, for us, what does that mean? For sure, we're going we're gonna to emphasize and spend a lot of things on people like the prison as soon as it opens back up after, allows us back in after the COVID deal. Foster care, Big Give in Haywood, Compassion. We have a Compassion Day coming up in December where we're going to try to sponsor another 1,000 children, not just in Ecuador, but beyond that as well. So is that good? That's great stuff. But worship, all that stuff, the activity flows from the priority. Got that? Worship is the priority. The activity is helping people. And so here's the challenge. Uh, I know you're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not really into worship. I just come for the sermon. I hear that sometime. I'm not into worship. I'm, I'm, you know, the, the question is not are you into worship. The question is are you into Jesus? That's the question. Because if you're into Jesus, you're into worshiping Jesus. The enemy, this is like the little rhema this week. As people are coming back after a crazy couple of years, it dawned on me as well that the enemy is fine with you sitting in church with no response. The enemy's fine with you sitting in church like a bump on the log, sitting on your blessed assurance, thinking, you know what? I'm okay. I'm okay. He's okay with that. No change, no repentance, no fervency, no joy, just sitting there. He is fine with that. And the way we end services is starting to become part of our culture. You could argue that the way we end the service is the most important part of the service. So a couple times you'll see Jesus say to people like us, I want you to have a heart like a child. I want you to become more childlike not childish, but childlike. As a matter of fact, one place he says, if you don't have faith like a child, you can't even go to heaven. And so childish, childlike worship is like super trusting. It's like Mary. She's not really concerned about what Judas was thinking or even the disciples were thinking. She wasn't even thinking pragmatism. She was just thinking, this is amazing. And so this past week, it was actually during the Wednesday night rehearsal. Uh, one of the small little daughters of our, go ahead and put it up there. Uh, one of the daughters of our, one of our worship leaders was sitting there. And so you can see mom and dad are up there practicing on the platform. Kind of leave that up there if you would for a second. And this is not planned. Nobody gave her like a, you know, a cookie to do this. 
This was just a little girl who's been discipled by mom and dad about how awesome Jesus is, and mommy's up there singing a song, and a little two-year-old, all she knows how to do is this right here. And if I were to show you the video, I had a little movement to you. That would make some of you real nervous. I mean, but she had, she had a little movement going as well. And some of you are like, raising my hands makes me uncomfortable. Raising my hands makes me uncomfortable. I'm not trying to be a... I'm not trying to be a jack with you. I'm just saying, Jesus went through some serious discomfort for you. And when you raise your hands, that can mean so many things. Now, the heart is what he's looking for, granted. Seriously, I'm not trying to manipulate somebody into doing that. All I'm saying is, but what you do see in the Bible is full-bodied worship. You see people who are actively engaged. Sure, your heart, but numerous times it's like, let the people raise their hands in the house of God. That means dependence, it means, God, you're awesome, it means I got nothing here, it means surrender, it means a lot of things. It says use your hands, use your mouth, use your eyes, multi-sensory kind of deal. And uh, we talked about come, sing, bring, come, sing, bring, come, sing, bring. And where I kind of that hit home months ago, I was actually preaching at a church in Florida. The first time I heard this song, we're going to sing. And, as, uh, and that was a response song. I'd never heard the song before. And I had a couple of worship guys with me. Lori couldn't go, so I took some guys with me as well. And I was like, hey. And we heard that song. We're like, that, that's, it's, called, it's called Make Room. It's just called Make Room. And there's a couple of things in there. It's like, here I lay it down. Here I lay it down. And he says, every burden, every crown. I thought that's exactly what God's doing at Biltmore. Here's my burden. Here's my shame. Here my accomplishment. Here's my little alabaster box that I've poured my life into. Here it is, and I'm just surrendering about. Because bottom line is surrender is the heart of worship. Surrender is the heart of worship. And you guys, we got to do that like every day. Because we always, I mean, what's the problem when you put something on an altar? Is it, is it climbs off the altar. So every day it's like, here it is. And so Sundays is kind of that time where we're like, like steroid, let's, let's make sure we get that thing out there. That's why we plan to make 73 minutes as facilitate worship as best we can. So here's what we talk about. We talk about come, sing, bring. Come, sing, bring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a brief prayer. And even in the middle of my prayer, whatever campus you're at, that would be the time. Come means, hey, we come to the altar. Just like the song says, I'm going to make room for you. All right? I'm going to make room. I'm going to lay down my crown. I'm going to lay down my burden. I'm going to lay down my shame. Whatever that little box is, I'm going to lay it down. Maybe it's just been apathy. I'm going to come lay it down. And you just come and kneel at the altar and give it to the Lord. Sing. Some of you are just going to sing, and here's my challenge to you. Let's do, do something that you don't ordinarily do to express gratitude to God. If this is going to be a gratitude party, do something that expresses gratitude that you normally do not do. For some of you, it's like super simple. All you got to do is sing, because normally you just sit there. I'm talk, but this time you're going to like engage and sing. Some of you are going to slip that hand up. Some of you are going to slip up two hands. You're going to touch down Jesus. It's going to be an awesome, awesome day. And uh, as soon as this, we planned it out, the one thing you don't ever see in any worship scene that I've ever seen is like, eh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to, even in the middle of prayer, Come sing, bring. Bringing, we don't, we're not passing a plate. This is the time where a lot of y'all just need to sit there and go, God's blessed me, I want to bless others. Start off small. Sponsor a compassion child, do something like that. Give something to help the people that are we're still open in Haywood County. But Father, our prayer is that in the next five minutes, there will be gratitude parties going up all over the place. God, I don't want to pray for the Hendersonville campus at that place would be a, just a big old gratitude party. Got to pray for our folks out in Franklin. Just gratitude to what you have done and what you are doing would just emanate from that place, that the people's voices would rise and it would give you, it would bless you. Got to pray for our folks in East and West and even our 
folks over there at Buncombe County Correctional Center that the response of the people of God, whether it be repentance, whether it be coming and kneeling at an altar, whether it be singing, whatever it is, God, we want to bring that to you. We want to make room for you. So we bring you our shame. We bring you our burdens. Thank you that you are a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you said, cast all your anxiety upon you. Why? Because you care for us. And so our prayer is, again, the next five minutes as we respond, as we take this last section of worship, it would just be nothing more than a big old gratitude party of people saying, we are grateful for who God is and what God has done. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, go ahead and stand to your feet. Stand to your feet and uh, be singing, be coming to pray, be writing a big old check to Compassion International, whatever it is you want to do. Come sing green.